and, and, and use your colleagues for support and also to try and support other people across the business because I, I do think as a as a business we are absolutely wonderful in terms of pulling together and really having that family culture and environment and I think you know we should be able to really support each other if we if we if we do that effectively. So we've asked David to come along. Um, David has an absolutely incredible CV. I don't know where to start in terms of um, positioning him, but um, David started work with the London Fire Brigade and, and was attending many serious incidents when he was working there. He then led a team who um, coordinated across major incidents between the military, the government and the emergency services, which obviously could be incredibly challenging in and of itself. But whilst dealing with major incidents must have been um, absolutely terrifying undertaking. Um, and he was also the lead officer in the um, July terror bomb um, attacks that we had and um, supported a lot of colleagues going through the, the inquests around those um, around those incidents. And then he moved into an even more high pressured industry into um, the civil, civil nuclear industry um, and largely uh, did a lot of work on, on, on preparing and emergency response there. So um, he has a particular passion for mental health. But as you can see, he's also he's also got a lot of experience dealing with um, incidents and issues where um, mental health could be a could be a real challenge. So um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from you, David. I'll hand over to you and um, just thank you so much for everyone who came today. Lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Claire. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this uh, this session. Um, I've been got about our well-being and actually little things, little changes that we can make to make improvements to our life. And hopefully there'll be um, sort of well established uh, as well. Um, the yeah, as clear in the introduction, yeah, basically London Fire Brigade for 31 and a bit years, um, went to many different incidents. Um, and in terms of, um, of those incidents, seeing how you know, I, I responded to them, how my teams responded to them all the way up as I sort of went up through the uh, uh, through the ranks from you know, working at sort of Fire stations like in the middle of London, like Deptford, Peckham, New Cross, that sort of area where I where I grew up, seeing how people respond to things, seeing actually sometimes that some people respond to a really big incident in one way, whilst the same incident, some people respond in a in a slightly uh, slightly different way. And that was sort of I didn't really notice it at the time, but subsequently doing some work uh, around the uh, 7th of July bombing inquest. We had those three bombs in 2005 within the underground system um, in London and a bus bomb as well. Um, I was working with quite a few teams, some people that have been to the incidents uh, and others that were just reading the um, about the events, some of the legal services, some of the professional services. And what I saw in there is that some people were almost... <laughs> You know, embedding, you know, creating images and embedding it in their in their heads, which was having quite a profound um, impact on them, and that sort of sparked my interest in, um, yeah, how people respond to things. I'd previously completed um, a master's in, in criminology, um, and that was a lot about how people think about things, how people uh, respond to events as well. That was my fire brigade career. My I did get you know, quite fortunate. My son joined the fire brigade as well. He was uh, he was at Brixton Fire Station for ten years. Now he's at Clapham, um, and he attended the uh, Grenfell Tower fire on the first night that it was properly um, alight, and went in. I think he volunteered to go in for the fourth time when it was alight, and you know went up to the middle of the middle. Um, and it was interesting to hear his response and look at the fire brigade's response to a someone who you know 25 years old to me when i was 25 in the i'll say late 80s i think yeah late 80s when i was 25 to see the the different ways in which we spoke about things or didn't think uh, speak about things as claire said I, I started i do some work as well now in the civil nuclear industry so i work with lots of ex-military people and police basically and we go around about terrorist threats and things like that at nuclear sites but when i started doing mental health work um, what I started seeing and noticing was that when I said oh, I'm going to start doing some work around uh, around mental health was that um, I was told by the people, I said, yeah, I want to do that. That's a girl's course. What are you doing that course for? You know, yeah, you're, yeah, you've been in the fire brigade. And I said, well, actually, we've got to look at it. I think we've got to start looking at it differently. And it's not about that. It's about these organisations I've come for from um, 
predominantly quite male orientated organisations, um, people not speaking up, not sharing things. But I've seen how powerful it can be when people start sharing things, but equally having someone there that can properly and really, really listen to them. So as we go through uh, through this session uh, today, a um, couple of ground rules uh, on this. And this is the same for most mental health courses and sort of seminars like this. This is about making sure that this is somewhere um, safe for you to be. So three main ones. The first one, this non-judgmental attitude. Um, and by that, I mean, we've all got different backgrounds, uh, different experiences, different ways of viewing the world. Um, we live in different areas of the, of the UK. You've been at ground force different uh, ground control different times um, you've got different experiences and our views our prism by which we view life can be quite different so if anybody's sharing anything on either by speaking or on the chat we're making sure that all the way through it we're respecting um, their views uh, secondly the confidentiality so it's as usual with a lot of courses and little seminars, you learn some stuff from the seminar and hope you'll learn some um, some um, things today. But equally, you might learn from others uh, as well. Um, and I will sort of just use a sort of a, a couple of names as I can um, as just as they come up up now. And what I'm going to say is it's about confidentiality is that we don't attribute anything that we might learn. So Angelina might speak about a friend of hers called Vanessa, who has a particularly serious eating disorder. And Angelina might speak about Vanessa's physical health, what happens to her socially, her weight gain, weight loss, her emotions and the treatment she's having. Um, and then but Amy and Adrian could then use that information, but they wouldn't say that it was Angelina that said it about Vanessa and that and that Emma, Jane and Tim were in the room at the same time. So we can use the information, but without add any attribution. So sort of what goes on tour stays on tour or don't talk about Fight Club, whichever one really works uh, for you on that. Finally, opt out. Now, the slides are quite plain slides, but I know from delivering lots and lots of courses, that as we go through these courses and start talking about different issues. I don't know what's going to be raised in the chat room or by people raising their hands today. Um, so if something, if we're going through this and I come to you for a question or you think actually this is a bit too close to home for me or an hour of talking about mental health is too much, opt out means actually if you need to just sit there quietly and not respond to requests to put something in the chat or respond if I ask a question or something like that. You just want to sit there quietly, that's fine. Equally, if this raises anything at all with you, please um, get in contact with Claire afterwards and she'll be keeping an eye on, on how the, the course progresses uh, today. Um, so ground rules, yeah, non-judgmental, confidentiality um, and opt out. So as I said, I saw lots of things in my you know, work. So when I joined the fire brigade in 1983, uh, it's really scary because it's 40 years ago now. Uh, um, so 40 years ago, I joined the fire brigade. Very much, we don't talk about mental health. You just get on with it. You shut up. You just go to the pub, have a drink. Uh, and I did that quite a number of times. We go through a really bad fire. And how would you deal with it? Yeah, too many. Yeah, one too many pints and a kebab or a curry afterwards. We don't talk about it. That's changing, I think, now in terms of the you know, very sort of male orientated organisations, in terms of people speaking about things and being more confident to raise concerns about about their mental health. I think I've seen changes as well. As uh, Claire said, I do lots of mental health courses. I do a lot of work with construction industry. So an awful lot of work with um, a company, uh, aggregate industries. I do a lot of work with them. I do lots of lots of work with um, agriculture sector. So the farming community. So I'm often in Suffolk and Norfolk um, doing work there and also with other organisations. But I should say that whether I'm going to as I'm going to next week to a, a law firm in Canary Wharf, a lot of the issues are very similar. The context in which people work, whether it's a farm or a you know, big office in the middle of uh, Canary Wharf, these are very much about people issues, but in some industries where it's almost that expectation that you're going to just have this stiff upper lip, you're not going to talk about things. 
that's when it can be quite uh, quite problematic. What I see sometimes on industries where there are people that are working on like contract work, if they are, you know, they get a day rate, um, they're not going to talk on a big building site about their poor mental health uh, because actually they're going to get kicked off the job is their perception. And sometimes um, that's uh, the reality as well. I think also you see the in terms of health and safety, you have lots of really good health and safety departments I've come across. And a lot of them are very, very good at safety, really good at the slips, trips and falls, working at height, confined space, Desia, Kosh, all those things. Very good at safety, but not very much on health. And I often get, oh, don't worry about that. That's the uh, HR deal with the other part of health, the other thing that is called uh, called mental health. One of the other things I think I've seen is it's quite sort of generational. Older people um, don't talk as much about um, or don't generally don't talk about as much about their mental health as maybe younger generation um, will do. So my son's 30, daughter's 29. Yeah, quite happy to talk about it as a normal part of a conversation. But in some older generations, it's quite different. And in, in, in terms of how do we approach that, then it's about thinking about the whole context of the person. Are they a young person? They are an older person. Are they male? Are they female? Have they got some cultural views or some faith views around mental health as well, which might prevent that person or provide a barrier to that person to speak about about their mental health? So as I said, as I was coming to do this course, it was, yeah, why are you doing that? This is not a course for someone, you know, for a man to do. But I think it's really important that we have that. I've got no lived experience of poor mental health or mental illness, but I don't think you need to um, have that. I think it's about having that understanding uh, of people um, and actually some of the situations um, they might be facing. So I said mental health a few times. So in the chat box, if you could, what's the term mental health mean to you? It's something that we see There'll be somebody talk about it on the television tonight. It will be on Loose Women right now. Someone will talk about uh, mental health. There will be something going on there. So in the chat box, what's the term mental health mean to you? And I will come to a couple of you afterwards to open your microphones. So if you could just stick something in the chat box, please. What's the term mental health mean to you? Yep, everyone has mental health, yep, state of mind. Yeah, I think as Jess, Jess says, yeah, that hidden side of, of what's happening, yeah, what's going on, that well being. Yep. Good place, that cognitive functioning, yeah, how we're thinking, the health of your mind and soul, absolutely, yeah. So I won't, I'm not going to read um, all of those. Let's just come to a couple of people. Let's come to Tim Wilson, first of all. Tim, the term mental health for you. If you could unmute, please, Tim. Thanks. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, the, the place that the person's in, in their brain, what they're thinking, um, <laughs> how they perceive that other people see them, how they perceive that they're themselves to be. Um, I, I believe you were, you took our course and we talked about um, one of the things. It's actually just been the anniversary. I had my sweeper driver take his own yeah. life last year, and it's yeah. literally been one year last week that that, that mm. happened, uh, which yeah. is one of the things that prompted me to coming on doing this course. Yeah, and yeah. It, you know, the the thinking that knowing that if maybe I'd have known what I did now, I might have been able mm. to, to to guide him in the right direction. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks, Tim. Thanks for for sharing that, and nice to nice to see you again. I knew I did pick on you. Pick on you. Sorry, invited you to speak because I knew you'd been on the course. Let's come to um, let's come to someone else. Uh, um, let's come, Amy. Um, Amy, I can't, I can't see your last name there, Amy. Amy Bash, somebody. Amy, your thoughts. Hello. Yeah. Um, it's something that everyone has. The only difference is whether it's a good day or a bad day, and I think it's mm. also the way that you speak to yourself. Um. Yep. And I think that does affect your thought patterns. If you're having a really good day, then the day generally goes a lot more positive. It has such a massive effect on your day to day just by mm. what's going on in your head. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Mark Curry, Mark, is it is mental is a term mental health a positive term or a negative term or a neutral term? Excuse me, sir, my my voice at the moment. Um okay. yeah, it's it's a positive term because we should all have 
good mental health and I know some of us have poor mental health yep. just the same as being having physical health some are good some are bad yep. so um yeah for me it's uh, about opening your mind having those discussions um and uh, having those focus points to improve and by talking we can improve lovely thanks very much mark and hannah mental health you think it's seen as a positive negative or neutral term for me at mental health is neutral because i think it can be good or bad yep um is yeah so i think that that's more the sort of yeah everybody has mental health um yep. as i can't remember who it was someone just said it could be good you know it could be a good day where it's you've got good mental health or it could yep. be a bad day um or it could just be you know just just average absolutely um, yeah. but yeah quite neutral as a term yeah, I think some. I think it's moving slightly towards that. Um, yeah, so often it's been, and I think it's moving in that good direction in terms of being neutral or it's just a term. Because if you ask the same question, what is the term physical health, negative, neutral, or positive? It's just well, it's just physical health. And and like a couple of people have said, we all have mental health, but you often get that point. We say, watch out for him. He's got mental health. He has, but he's, we've all got mental health. We've all got physical health. We've all got social health. And in very basic terms, mental health is how we think, how we feel and how we behave. Thinking being the most important one, because thinking has consequences both in terms of our uh, emotions um, and our behaviour. So we all have mental health. We all have physical health and we all have this other thing called social health, that interaction with people um, and network uh, as well so far. So let's just have a look at um, a couple more on these chats here. Uh, Laura, uh, yeah, Devlin says, being able to handle what's going on emotionally and mentally, the same as you would physically lift a box. Absolutely. So we are going to face, we'll be faced with challenges um, about, uh, about physical health. We'll face challenges around our mental health as well. And what stops us, do you think, what stops us starting a conversation with others about our mental health. Now, for me, I was talking to Claire at the beginning, you know, saying I like to do a bit of running and stuff like that. And I can happily moan for weeks about my ankle or my hip or something like that. But to talk about my mental health, it's something a little bit different. And I still have that little bit of stigma there um, around it sometimes. So in the chat box, what stopped us? Yeah, OK, so in the chat box, Mark started already. What stops us having a conversation with others about our mental health? That thing that we've all got. We've all got physical health. We've all got, we've all got social health. We've all got mental health. But what stops us starting a conversation with others about our own mental health? Yeah, so as Tim's put down there, that pride, the judgment, the stigma around it because although I ask that question is mental health a positive or negative term um, or neutral we still there's still that stigma around it being perceived as being weak um, from Maddie absolutely yeah the judgment perception have changed people see you differently yeah and it's that the word differently has come up quite a few times in there judgment and difficult and stigma um, and as Laura um, Devlin said it's harder to show externally. So when I do some of my courses, I say actually physical health is much easier to do. A physical first aider. If you see someone with their leg that's snapped, the leg snapped, it's all deformed, they're shouting and screaming, and that's really easy to understand what's happened to that person. That invisibility of mental health can be quite scary for some people. Um, so Jane, it's something that's private, not like physical health that people can more readily see for themselves. You have to be prepared to share um, and Shelley said you don't want to be seen a burden um, on, on that side as well. Uh, Jane, can you unmute, please? So can you just go a little bit more on your one about what stops us starting a conversation? Yeah, so I mean, from, from my point of view, I think once you start sharing, then it's a little bit like an onion, isn't it? You have to be you have to agree with yourself how much you want to share. Yeah. And you have to work out, you know, how much the other person wants to hear about what you want to share and how capable mm. they are of coping with it as well. So yeah, it's absolutely. a little bit of a judgment, a little bit of a judgment call, isn't it? Um, mm. But I've only been here um, two days, David, and I'm quite, you know, willing to share with people. So 
Okay, that's great. That's great. So welcome to uh, welcome to Ground Control. And um, I think coming, you know, I would imagine if I'd gone to an organisation that would be doing mental health and wellbeing in the first couple of days, I'd be very, very pleased that you can see that uh, that's happening. I do some courses for a, a local drama college near me and uh, they just do for the kids that are coming in from abroad. They just started doing some mental health and wellbeing stuff because they thought that would be a great thing to do. They really wanted to do it. But what that's done is transferred into more pupils and more parents who are sending their children across the world to come to this drama school in SIGCUP um, that actually, yeah, we're going to look after our children. So there's that business benefit as well there um, about doing that side of it. Um, the, oh, oh, I've done that. Oh, we've got so many participants here. Sorry, I'm just looking at how many participants. I can't see everyone on the screen at the moment um, on that side of it. Um, Okay, so we've got a whole thing about stigma there and about what you know, what people are going to think of me. Am I going to be judged? Am I going to be seen as weak? Um, what will people's views of me? Are they going to exclude me? I'll be socially excluded. excluded. Uh, that burden and pride comes up a couple of times. As Mark says, self-disclosure is uh, always a good starting point. Little snippets about how you feel. Yeah, it doesn't have to be the whole thing about you're going to, someone says, how are you? And they tell you they're whole life and then bring out sort of charts and medical reports it doesn't it's not like that it's just about having those um, other other ones and as Heather's put down there is it jumping on the bandwagon I, I suppose you might see in some parts people think oh, okay I want to use that as an excuse mental health um, but I think often it's been quite it's been quite um, suppressed um, in terms of talking about it so that's why more things like this uh, you yeah, know we're delivering many more courses like this um, across different organizations so is this uh, is this similar as well then this question so slight change what stops us starting a conversation with others about their mental health so what stops us so you've all re re recognized like, what stops us having a conversation about our own mental health what about the other way around what stops us starting that conversation with others about their mental health Yeah. Feels like you're asking something very, very private, uh, not feeling prepared. Yeah, that's one that comes up all the time. If someone says, you know, if I go along from my running club at Alpington and say, oh, my, well, yeah, my knee really hurts. I say, oh, well, what you want to do is you want to you know, ice it and rest it for a while and stuff like that. But that mental health, how do we respond to something? This is quite a sort of this new concept. It's something we've had for years and years and years, but it's quite this... Uh, um, this new concept that we've had there. Um, Kieran, yeah, not knowing if they're ready to ask for help. Um, what stops us as well, asking others, uh, scared of what might be involved in getting in too deep, and then what do you do about support? Well, I, I know that yeah, within, and we'll come onto this as one of the final slides, about you know, there is lots of support within your organisation. There's lots of ways uh, to signpost. There's um, external things as well that you can go for. So I think it's best being prepared to have that um, uh, that, that conversation with someone. And how do we open that conversation? How do we start it? Um, if I put it, if I change that slightly and said, what stops us starting a conversation with others about their physical health? How might that be different? I come to Maddie. Maddie, what if it's if it's about physical health? What would be the difference? Hello, um, I think that with physical health, like you said earlier, um, people feel a lot more prepared to answer the question. So we've yeah. all been brought up talking about physical health. Oh, Gran's yeah. got a sore knee, so she can't go on a walk. Or yeah. oh, I've hurt my leg at school today, and I went to the nurse's office, and she took a look at it, and she gave me an ice pack. And people have always been exposed to that. So it's the we know where to refer someone. Oh, have you been to the doctor? Oh, you should probably call A&E. Have you called 999? Yeah. That's really serious. They can help yeah. you. And we have all of the answers. So it takes away the fear of asking the question. And also it's just been normalised since day one. Whereas yeah. we don't necessarily have that for mental health. Someone comes to you and they go, well, yeah, thank you for asking. I actually feel really suicidal today. Yeah. And yeah. you're going, uh, OK, I don't yeah. I like I don't know. How can I help you? I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to make it worse. Yeah. I don't know who to refer you to. Yeah. And now I just feel like I've made the situation 10 times worse. So I won't ask. Absolutely. Yeah. And, that, and that's a difficulty. So you, you're confronted with this thing that you see something different in someone. You think I might approach them. But what if I say the wrong thing or, or what if I say the right thing? 
actually I don't know so I won't say anything at all which is probably the most dangerous thing because if you're gonna you might say the wrong thing but at least you started a conversation there um Sandra Batram you've put down there uh, yeah nothing I'm more than happy to sit down and talk with someone uh would you like to open your mic and hello hiya um yeah um well if um someone feels suicidal yeah you would still say call 999 speak to your doctor ring yeah. 101 option two for the mental health crisis line or yeah. if you've i mean surely you, you'd think there was something a bit off for the, you to ask about their mental health you wouldn't just stand at the coffee machine and go hi how's your mental health today that's not something yeah. you would do you'd clearly think there was something a little bit off and it's yeah. like always that ask twice like how are you and if they go fine and then you go yeah. how are you really like mm. we've seen yeah. with the celebrities that have taken their own lives and that they've seen really chirpy and you're like oh i can't believe they've like taken their own life like robin williams and that is such a fun co like comical guy you you get to know people and you get to know if there are things that are slightly wrong yeah but unless someone says oh i'm feeling suicidal and you go mm. Come on, then I'll walk you to the nearest bridge that goes over the motorway. You're not going to yeah. say something wrong. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that's the whole thing. And back one of the words you used there, we talked about sort of that judgment. If we approach someone and we say, What's wrong with you? We've already got it in our heads that there's something wrong. There's an error or there's a failure or something. So we might use terms instead, like what's happened, you know, what's been happening with you. Yeah, and something so, triggered you. It might be one of their triggers that's yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So we, yeah, so we'll ask sort of what, what's happened there. Uh, Kieran, uh, Kieran Bedwell, Kieran, uh, your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I think it's um, knowing that they're ready. They may be in a place where they're just not quite ready to talk about it, and that's necessary. Just letting them know that you are there. Yeah. If, when they are, kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah, and that can make a real difference to people. And I've spoken to so many people that say, oh, yeah, and it doesn't have to be a huge intervention that you t that you take, and it's not about you know, sending them to uh, an employee assistance program or to HR or to the doctors or anything. Just someone, you know, acknowledging that they're, um, that they, 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 you know, their pain or suffering is recognised by someone else and just say, yeah, it must be really tough. That, that sounds awful. Um, uh, it must be so difficult. That might, that is often enough for people, for some people to say, actually, yeah, thanks for that. And I feel better already because you've at least acknowledged it. You're not doing anything about the situation, but you've acknowledged it. Um, let's move on um, a little bit um, now there. So that right at the beginning um, of the course, we've talked about you know, and some of the things that you put in the chat about stigma uh, and discrimination. Um, so stigma is that value or belief that we have about something in the case we're talking about now is about mental health so um what is you know that stigma that sign that we put we, that stands up in front of us when we talk about the term mental health or someone who's been diagnosed with schizophrenia and we think oh it's dr jekyll mr hyde that is good cop bad cop they're going to be nice one moment and then they're going to be dangerous the next lots of misinformation lack of knowledge leading to that stigma and that invisibility as well we can't we can see that broken leg is easy but not being able to see what's happening inside someone's head can make it a little bit where we get to that point of being being judgmental and the stigma is one thing about our values and beliefs and then the discrimination is the behaviors associated with it and that can come down to language as well so um, about, you know, I've already said about, OK, if you start saying things like what's wrong with you, we've almost come from that position of we've labelled it already as an error or a problem. Um, but actually, it's just something that's happened to the person and things happen to all of us. I'm not going to ask you to disclose anything, but things happen and we respond in different ways at different times, depending on where we are in our life, how our physical health is, how our social health is, how our mental health is. But sometimes that discrimination might extend to treating people differently in the workplace or even when we said about what stops us starting a conversation about our own mental health is actually people are going to think differently of me. So my behaviour or the way in which I'm going to express myself is I'm going to hide things. I'm not going to be able to talk, it, talk about it, almost like self-stigmatising. And then you think about language in the workplace. So as a rhetorical question, what would happen within uh, ground control if you used uh, sexist, racist, misogynistic or homophobic language? Um, 
I would imagine that there's there will line managers and others would like try to and co colleagues as well would challenge that immediately and it might even lead to some sort of dismissal. But when we hear people saying things like a bit, oh, he's just a bit of a nutter, a bit crazy, just lost the plot, a bit of a drama queen, we start using those terms. And for that person that's really struggling, might think actually this is a sort of a term that I actually is not really particularly helpful for me. Um, and I'm very much far, I'm quite far away from sort of being sort of the morality police or the language police. But I think it's just about thinking about, OK, what language do we use sometimes in the workplace um, that might be a bit discriminatory in terms of someone's mental health? Because a sexist, racist, misogynistic, homophobic language wouldn't be tolerated. And I think it's just about not setting to stop having sort of, um, you know, talking to someone in language that they, you know, they accept, but equally just thinking about your language a little bit there. Um, and equally, the person themselves might use the language to say, oh, yeah, I'm just taking some happy pills at the moment. I just need to pull my socks up. Don't worry about me. I just need to pull my socks up because I don't want to say they're struggling to say, yeah, it's just a little bit going on now. But I think it's those things that we spoke about earlier about, um, yeah, making sure that we are they're ready to talk at that time. And as Kieran said, yeah, just be there for them um, and be able to listen to them um, later on. So talking about the listening side, how might we? How might we listen more effectively to someone? What sort of things can we do? I see lots of campaigns, and I think you will as well, around um, um, it's good to talk, open up, start talking. I've even done stuff with big television companies who had their adverts on about it's good to talk, but I know that in those organisations they don't talk about their mental health. So it's great to talk, but very importantly, it's about that listening. So what sort of things do you think? Um, OK, so Tim's got that eye contact. Absolutely. Yeah. Looking at that, that appropriate eye contact with someone. Um, ask questions and then shut up. Jez, absolutely spot on. That's really good. That um, that just being quiet. And sometimes we think, actually, if it goes quiet, we've got to fill that void of quietness with some words. But silence is really effective just allows that person to think the person to think about what they might say next and it allows you to think about what question I might might ask. Uh, Paula says yeah give full attention. Um, Amy really important about planning how you're going to talk to someone about you know making time cancelling meetings or postponing stuff finding, finding somewhere uh, safe to go to. Um, and, and Sandra there about repeating things back yeah I think it's that summarizing we don't necessarily repeat back word for word because that shows we that we can we can understand we can copy and say exactly the same back to them but maybe summarize or paraphrase what they've said which really says it to them that actually yeah you are really listening um charlotte has got a thumbs up on this one um ask them whether they want us to provide solutions or just listen that's a really important one so that one there approach someone with the intention of understanding what's happening, not with the intention of fixing things. So go there with the intention to listen and understand, but not about fixing everything. Because if you go there thinking, OK, I've got a, and I'm really bad at that. I, I, I'm often I'm not a great listener. Sometimes I need to train myself. I'm often wait. I wait to speak. Once that person breathes in, then I'm in there and I'm thinking, OK, what you need to do is that, that, that. Think about, have you thought about doing this? Try this. Here's this number. Do it now. And I'm very much like that. But I think that comes from my previous work in trying to sort of respond um, uh, to areas as well there. So this comfortable eye contact. Um, Claire, what are some of the things that are standing out for you um, on these on this chat at the moment? Claire Grant. Um, so I think for me, it's the it's the challenges that we that we all have around actually not um, not just giving our own views during those conversations. Yeah. So I know for me, I always want to try and make things better. So actually stepping back and really listening is 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 a huge challenge for me mm. because I always want to reassure or to give a solution. And yeah. and I, I I'm seeing this. I'm seeing Jez saying I'm a fixer. I have to stop fixing and 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 yeah. and, and listen. I'm seeing people saying that, you know, making sure that there's protected time with 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 no distractions, asking the right questions and listening with all of with all of all of their senses. Yeah. And I think I, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think a lot of people have a challenge around just sitting there and absorbing what is being mm. said to them without interacting yeah. themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm exactly like that. And, and yeah, and as Jez said, yeah, he's a fixer. Um, but he does just have to he just has to shut up sometimes. Sorry, Jess, I know I don't know you, but um yeah, I agree with you. Let's come to Adrian. Adrian, your thoughts. 
Adrian Hewitt. Right. You're on mute, Adrian. Right. Thank you. That's it. Yes. Um, I find with your own experience sometimes try and try and give a bit of support through through what you've suffered with, I think, mm. at times. It's always yeah. a good thing. I th yeah, I think you I think you can get to that. I think there's that balance you've got to we've got to make about actually not making it about yourself at the but at the right stage. So I think that listening first of all, don't say, well, this happened to me or this happened to my sister, and if I were you, I'd do this. I think a lot of it is that that seeking first to understand before seeking to be understood. So understand it and then yeah. you might get into that other part later on and saying, yeah, they might say, well, what do you think? What's happened? So you have that sort of empathic response, which we'll come on to um, in, into in a minute. Um, so as Maddie says, understand the person talking is the expert on how they're feeling. Absolutely. It's not you. You can't see inside their head. You don't know what's happened to them in their maybe their childhood or what's happening at work or physical health or family life. And it's there about you listening. Uh, and equally, I think when you become really good listeners, you'll be surprised uh, the extent to which people share things. And you thought, well, I only asked him how they were. And then, you know, Adrian's gone forward just to like, hey, feeling you know, what's going on, what's happening. And then they start sharing things because Adrian's done all the you know, good body language, eye contact, open questions, summarising, feeding back, all those sorts of things. Actually, you can have some really, really good conversations. But as other people have said on here already, if you think the conversation might be going that way, make sure you've got some space to have that conversation quite safely. Equally, when you're having the, some people are doing hybrid working or you might not be able to see them face to face, this me staring down the lens of a camera at the moment is uncomfortable for me and staring to someone's eyes is uncomfortable sometimes as well. So if you get a chance, if you're doing something remotely um, and you're trying to have a conversation with someone on a lot of Zoom call or something, sometimes just say to them, look, you pick up your mobile phone, I'll pick up mine and we'll go for a walk. And you just go for a walk in your own areas and that can be easier. As someone said in there, texting someone can be easier than saying it out loud uh, and that works sometimes i worked on the crisis text line when covid first hit and people were texting in things like i don't know who they were because i was just one of the sort of the uh, you know volunteers but texting people do say things um maybe a lot more and not using their own voice when i was in the fire brigade we did some stuff with young kids which was about um juvenile fire setting and we used puppets and they they spoke via the puppets, if you like, it was that sort of thing. So just just think about what's going to make it more comfortable um, there. And as Sandra says at the bottom there, um, you know, don't you know, don't, you know not ever telling them they're stupid. Or it's a man up and grow a pair. It's all those things. We don't do that. We don't go into those areas there. Um, this is flying by, isn't it? So this empathic response we're going to try and deliver. So there's a difference between empathy and sympathy okay sympathy is a pitying response it's i'm so sorry you're sad um, and i'm going to keep some sort of detachment away from you so that um the pathy word that part of the word is pathy is about suffering the sim part is with so with suffering but you've got that slight detachment so you're saying i'm so sorry you feel sad empathy is something we should be striving for and that's in suffering so the m e m is in so that that is about understanding the person's emotions you might not get all the complex problems that they're facing but if you can understand at an emotional level and they say yeah i know what upset feels like i know what sadness feels like i know what anger feels like and i get it it must be so difficult for you that empathic response is really important it's much much more so than that sympathetic uh, hitting uh, response there. Um, let's just um, go on, where's it going? Oh, let's go back, sorry, let's flick forward too much there. Yeah, so someone, Rebecca O'Donnell uh, wrote, uh, empathy is walking a mile in someone else's boots and sympathy is being sorry that the not got any boots on their feet hurt. It's that sort of thing. So that empathy and sympathy, really different. Let's come back to Tim for a sec. Tim, your thoughts on this empathy and sympathy? Yeah, I, th I think if you if you sympathy, it's the condescending to the person. Um, a lot yeah. of the time, they'll they'll, they'll feel quite you know uh, might even feel aggrieved at it. Whereas yeah. empathy shows that you're um, you, that you're caring and you're listening and you're understanding what they're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I think there's a market for you know 
in empathy cards rather than in sympathy cards when someone dies, because I think you do need that that empathic response rather than others. Uh, let's come to uh, Maddie, your thoughts, empathy and sympathy. Could you unmute as well, please, Maddie? Yeah, that would help, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, I think empathy is like sitting with the person and their feelings and being there if they need you. Whereas, like you said, sympathy is quite that is quite a distance, isn't it? Yeah. It's like it's like saying, oh, that's really sad for you. You carry on mm. and deal with that. Whereas yeah. empathy is like I'm here for you. If however long it takes, I'm here and I'm by your side. So yeah just use me and I'll Abs be here to support you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And thanks, Jez, for putting in. So if you look in the chat and if you could copy this or I'll send it to Claire, the link as well. A very, very good film called Empathy and Sympathy by an American woman called Brené Brown. That's B-R-E-N-E apostrophe uh, with a, a Q accent on the last E, Brené Brown. And she did a TED talk, a TED type lecture, and they made it into a cartoon um, format. Really, really good. Uh, little film about three or four minutes long quite humorous as well um, in terms of actually how we might uh, approach and speak to someone so um, yep absolutely yep used yeah used it in training yeah we used uh, so I've done a mm, I think one course at ground uh, ground control and we cert and I certainly used it there I use it on every single course that I do so that empathic response okay, someone's got their mic open who's that I can't see <laughs> Who's laughing in the background? OK, lovely. OK, so let's just move on slightly then. So moving on about stress then. So is is stress good for us? Is stress good for us? In the chat box, anybody at all? Is it good for us or bad for us? OK, so. Uh, can be good and bad at the same time, can be motivating. Yeah, I think Charlotte's caught it there. Yeah, little stress is good motivator, but too much is a concern. Um, yeah, as, and as Amanda says, as long as we can cope and we're all different, absolutely. So stress is, it's um, sometimes quite, quite medicalised this, uh, as Hannah Neal says there, can be good at the correct levels. We've got this thing called eustress, so EU stress, and before anybody puts it in the chat box, it's not about Brexit or anything like that. It's that uh, e, it's that good stress, that stress that uh, motivates you, that gets you to stand up in front of colleagues and perform a song and dance, or finish that exam, or you know, play, you know go on a rugby pitch for forty minutes or you know, eighty minutes or so. I say forty minutes, I only last a half. So for eighty minutes on a rugby pitch or something like that, it's that good stress. It's that stress that gets us motivated. The other stress is um, and that so EU is good, like euphonium, good sound, euphoria, good feeling, you stress that good stress. But what we're going to talk about now is distress, the stress which starts affecting us in both those cases, whether it's you stress, like standing on a stage or distress, you know, overwork, family illnesses and things like that. The body still responds um, in exactly uh, exactly the same way because it doesn't differentiate between what are the causes of the stress but what it does do is to release sort of cortisol and adrenaline into either the, like, the nervous system or the bloodstream so we can have this um, fight flight freeze or fawn um, response to the whatever threat is facing us so whilst that you stress that might last about sort of 90 minutes to an hour or something like that whilst those drugs are going through us uh, sort of cortisol and adrenaline going through us the body says oh what what don't I need and it suppresses the appetite it suppresses the immune system and for 90 minutes that's yeah that's fine you can do that for a short period of time it becomes into distress like the body's adverse reaction to overpressure it starts becoming problematic when those stress hormones keep going round and round and round and the stress never goes away and that link between the physical health and mental health is really there um yeah, and stress in stroke, but both could be a motivator. Yeah, if you can manage it, and we're all all totally different in terms of how we sort of look look at things. We all have a stress uh, container, um, and our stress container basically is a size made by about the time we're in our mid twenties, when our frontal cortex has been uh, fully established, and how we work, learn how to deal with different stressors and how we respond to them. 
and it works something like this we have this pressure or life going into the top of this container here so it could be job demands it could be weather it could be you know, rail strikes it could be climate change or physical health put whatever you like into that bucket there and because it's sort of a fixed size and we've got a certain capacity to deal with with pressure we get to this point where we crack or we snap we overflow uh, and it could be that we start withdrawing we start overworking we drink too much maybe we just hide away we don't sleep and we start having this sort of stress signature you know for me i know if i start writing down lists it means i'm getting a little bit full up and i'm about to overflow other people that go quiet other people do, you know do different things you'll know what your own stress signature is there unless we can uh, open this tap so there's a tap at the bottom there if we keep it closed that's problematic but if we can keep it if get it open and think about things that we might be able to do around helpful coping strategies which might be um you know go having a sleep going for a run watching a film um, just being quiet reading a book some anything at all could be helpful and unhelpful things might be things like going to work yeah keep going to work not asking for help ignoring it going to drink and drugs to get yourself through things so we have these ways in which actually we recognize we're getting up to there with it and what we're going to do we're going to try and release it by saying to the boss you know can i yeah can we maybe change the deadline for this or managing sleeping you know those sorts of things that we can try and do to reduce that sort of that level within our own stress container let's come to a couple of people now let's come to uh, julia Julia and Katina. Yeah, right. That's me, Julia. Yeah. Julia, Julia, your thoughts on the stress container and stress in general? Me, stress is like I feel stressed when I uh, get out of the comfort zone. Um, yeah. So when things things are changing, but for me, it's always some place for growth. Um, but I'm talking about um, I'm talking about, I think, internal things, not external things like um, weather, climate change and life in general. So if it's something internal, I can um, I always open my tab and uh, speak up and share my my um, thoughts uh, with the closest ones. Yep. Uh, but with the pressure, like outside pressure, um, yeah, obviously you can talk it through with someone, but this is something like weather and climate change. You can't really um, take control over it. So you just yeah. uh, have to admit it and accept it. So um, yeah. that's about it. Absolutely. No, thank you. Yeah. And I think we just got to keep an eye on our sort of our stress containers. And I, I, I know that, um, that you yeah, know, ground control and, and and Claire especially are looking at actually okay, what do we do about about you know, work related stress? Because we can't do some things about you know, what's happening in the family, but work related stress certainly we can do. As I said, there's this clear link between uh, stress and the and the body. Um, and I won't sort of go into all of these. You just got a bit of an image there. But on that bottom left, the immune system, um, where that's suppressed. So you get the. Yeah, the immune system suppressed. So think about that time when you've been really pressured and stressed and everything. And I, I can sort of think about it when I've had re been really busy, got competing different demands. And I know for me, I start getting a little sore throat or something like that. Or when I was younger, I used to get, you know, spots or you know, hair. Sorry, it's not probably the right one to do the hair one with me, is it? But the throat hurting or something like that. And I'm not going to ask you to disclose what happens to you, but you'll all experience that sort of thing where you're feeling really really rubbish and you've got so much pressure going on and it starts then going into uh you know maybe those areas in which actually you start to have some physical um uh, reaction as well there just bring a couple of people in just said they recognize that so let's bring in um i've got to bring in charlotte barrett because i want to hear about her about hugh concern is that someone that works for you charlotte i know it's huge concern but charlotte you're one about the immune system and actually how it affects us um. <laughs> Yeah, that was a spelling mistake. Um, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think the body is good at communicating when you're run down in different yeah. ways and it affects different ways. Um, like uh, Obviously with physical health, but there are physical indicators that you are too stressed and especially yeah. with anxiety. I know a, a lot of people, it's to do with like their shoulders and their neck. If you get yeah. a lot of tension in your head and stuff like that, you can get headaches. Yeah. So it, it it's all linked. Um, yeah. 
and yeah it can just affect your ability to cope in yeah. general yeah absolutely yeah and, and we can't divorce that what happens to us physically might affect us mentally what happens to us mentally might affect us physically uh, as well and I know we're right, I know this is a very short seminar. I'd love to speak all day and for a few days on all these sorts of areas, but it's only a, a short one today. So about building resilience, we've spoken about that a little bit um, already in terms of that stress container. What can we do? Um, I think some of it is about, and people have put, put this in parts of the chat through this uh, this hour, about actually what you know, identify what are the things, you know, what are your warning signs, what are the triggers that might think actually there's becoming a bit of pressure there and that can be a way of actually avoiding those things which helps build your resilience about having that support network who are you going to speak to what are you going to do identifying what works for you is it going for a run is it going to you know the pub for a glass of wine or something like that is it speaking to friends and family whatever works for you in that side of it and then think about sleep sleep is so important getting that good night's sleep like seven and a half nine hours sleep a night if you can i know some of you might have young families or caring responsibilities five hours is a luxury you know so it's great me saying that like eight or nine hours but if it's sleep is really really important you know, getting outside hobbies interests anything at all that you can do to think about okay how do i open that tap um, on my stress uh, container. As we sort of come towards the end now, um, we've got one, I've got one big question after this next slide. But you think about, yeah, a few people have said, what am I going to be able to do? Where, where might I be able to signpost someone to in terms of when I talk to them, have that conversation with them, it's going to the direction where I need to think, OK, I've got to the point now where there's more support needed. I can't do it. What? Where can I go to? Find out what's available internally. I know you've got mental health first aiders. Um, you've got your colleagues, um, uh, line managers, HR. Find out what HR do, what they don't do, what your employee assistant program does, what it doesn't do. So you can at least say to the person, why don't you go and speak to the one of the mental health first aiders? Or, yeah, kind of speak to your line manager. She's she's great. She's really good. She's helped me out before on loads of things. Don't be don't be scared. She's um, you know she looks like a um, you know like a tough you know, tough nut, but she's really really good in in, in these areas here. But equally, those other ones, and I, and I know the people that have been on my courses have these ones already. Hub of Hope and Doc Ready. So Hub of Hope. If you look at that, it's you put in a postcode and it provides all the mental health providers in the area. So it'll be like the um, yeah you know, the Loughton um, Donkey um, Sanctuary is you know could be um, yeah for mental health. It could be yeah it could come. I don't know there is one at Loughton. It's only Loughton because my daughter's going to Loughton at the weekend, and then to some hideous wedding shop in uh, Lakeside later on uh, afterwards. I think uh, she's going down there, so that's why Loughton came up. And then Doc Ready really fantastic thing so when you're speaking to someone it, doc ready gets them ready for the doctor it's almost like a shopping list app what do you want to talk about how long has it been going on for play with it i haven't got time to go through it on the course now they're really in, you know, intuitive just go on them have a look share them as well so doc ready and others okay so as we sort of come to um um, as Tim said there, resilience report. Um, you can get a resilience report on yourself. We did this in our academy. Yep. Um, Babylon Health GP app, your line manager. Yep. Colleagues, Calm app. Yep. Loads of things out there. Have a look. OK, so as we come right to the end, there's 54 now. We've got a few minutes left in the chat box. What types of possibilities exist to improve the mental health of all of us at ground control? What sort of things could be put in place at ground control or would you like to see put in place at ground control to improve the mental health of everyone? So your chance to put some stuff in there. So what sort of things? And if you want to open up your microphone and say it instead of writing it down, I'm very happy for that to happen as well. What sort of things might you like to see? Less hours, of course, Dan. That's it. Yeah. And it's going to be pay rise in there. Yep. Yeah. Uh, easier access to content to help. Yep. Uh, make it the norm. And I think sometimes you might need that bit of transparency and openness from the C suites or those chief people, um, maybe. Um, flexible working hours. Yep. Go outside every day and have a walk. 
that physical stuff, that getting away from your desk and standing up and stretching your legs, um, really important. Anybody else got anything on there? Um, uh, knowing where to get information, that comes up quite a lot. Um, yep, exercise, Mark says exercise, do some, so do something with someone else, learn one thing a day, pay someone a compliment, make someone laugh. Um, absolutely, Mark, yeah, all those things there. And if you look at an organisation called Action for Happiness, they do some really good calendars that sort of summarise um, a lot of that as well. Um, more in-person get-togethers, because most people work remotely, yep. Um, people now have turned off their phones, they can't be contacted. Absolutely. I'm going to um, leave those those rolling there as we as we sort of come right to the end now. So what we've spoken about in this hour, and thank you so much for sharing, uh, e either by you know speaking when I've picked on you or in the chat box as well. So a, a very sort of quick summary around mental health and, and well-being and some of the things that we might do and some of the things around what prevents us um, speaking as well. I shall now come to back to Claire to close this because we've got about two or three minutes left and if anybody's got any questions okay thank you Claire. David thank you so much that was absolutely wonderful it's always good to um, get thoughts and also I was very grateful for the piece at the end because there's a lot of ideas for us when we're thinking yeah. about everybody's well-being um, I think the, the the one thing that I want to flag is so um, Monday, unfortunately, the coming Monday is supposed to be the most miserable day of the year. It's known as as as, as Blue Monday. Um, yeah. So we're going to follow the example of the Samaritans yeah. this year and we're actually going to do Brew Monday. And we want everyone to take some time out and, 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 and spend some time with one of their colleagues, whether that be remotely or whether that be in person in one of our offices. So um, we will be sending a communication out about that on Monday. But I would really, really strongly encourage you to take some time out and spend some time with a colleague not talking about work but talking about personal things I think we've we've been referencing that in the chat and how nice it would be to to talk and connect with each other without talking about work related things um if anyone is in the Billericay office I know that as always our wonderful Gary and the reception team have some fun activities planned as well so I understand they're coming around with a tea trolley and I have requested biscuits because I think tea always needs to come with biscuits um, so please, please do take that time. I know we all feel that we're incredibly busy, but um, this is mandated by Jason. So we have his full support. Take some time out, speak to some colleagues and, and just make it a nice part of your day. And um, for those of you that came back wanting to diet after Christmas, put it aside, have some have a little bit of sugar and have some biscuits with it. But Lovely. David, thank you ever so much. Really, really wonderful session. And I hope everybody enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you, thank you. And, and Maddie, if you could, uh, Martin, you've got a quick question there, Maddie, is it a quick one? Oh, it's not a question. I just thought I'd hijack the end of the call. Sorry, Claire. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've just, it's just something to think about as we're talking about mental health. Um, I've had lots of questions, uh, lots of conversations, weirdly and strangely, and news articles at the moment about the menopause. And I know it won't apply to us all, but I'm sure those who don't, it doesn't apply to, have people in their lives that it does apply to. Um, so it's just keeping an extra eye on those people that are going through the menopause and all the changes that that can bring and the impact that can have on people's mental health. And I think being able to open and have those conversations with people is really important. It might be someone who's never suffered before um, who comes into that stage of their life and it can be quite drastic especially in terms of mental health and I know there's um, there's an example in the news recently where a husband unfortunately lost his lifelong partner who'd never suffered previously and that was yeah. due to the changes that came with the menopause so I think when we're having those conversations and uh, with those people around us just to be aware of that and how we can offer support and maybe myself and Claire can um, get some information out to people. Lovely, Around thank well. you very much. Yeah, thanks, Maddie, thank you very much indeed. Um, Claire, thank you so much for inviting thank me to, to come along uh, for this quick session. Thanks for everyone. Tim, thank you, Look, great to see you looking so well, Tim. It's really nice to see you again there and thanks for contributing. And so I'll, uh, I'll sign off now then, Claire, and I'll be in contact with you separately. So oh, thanks God. very much, everyone. Thank, thank, you, thank, you, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.